We've thought about aggregate supply and aggregate demand, trying to understand a little bit better what might actually increase, kind of how are, how are, how's the price level and output related in the economy. Implicitly in that discussion, we've also been talking about interest rates, and we've been talking about a little better understanding of things that could shift the aggregate supply and the aggregate demand curves. Here what we're going to talk about are two specific types of ways that the aggregate demand curve could be shifted. It could be as a result of fiscal policy or monetary policy. And we're going to start with monetary policy. We're going to be discussing what's actually happening as, in, as interest rates change or as the money supply changes, things that the Federal Reserve does. So we're going to begin talking about the general theory of liquidity preference. This is from uh, John Maynard Keynes, uh, obviously a very famous economist who uh, w did a lot of work on growth, uh, kind of around the Great Depression and World War One. I'm sorry, World War Two, and coming out of that, kind of the new economy. And this theory really says that the interest rate adjusts to bring money supply and money demand into equilibrium. So there's a few things here, right, that kind of the terminology we'll be using when we talk about interest rate, we've been using R to discuss this before. Uh, we're going to be talking about the money supply as well, and when we talk about the money supply, I'll mark that as, as MS here, and then we're going to be talking about money demand as well, which we'll kind of mark as MD, right, money demand as well, just to keep these things uh, kind of straight in our minds. So one of the things we know is, let's start with money supply. What is the money supply itself? Well, we know that money supply, and I'll just mark this out, the money supply, right? This comes from the Federal Reserve. We know that the Federal Reserve can create money. We also know that money is created in the economy through the money multiplier from bank lending and things of that nature as well. Let's just focus on the actual kind of mechanics of the Federal Reserve itself. We know that kind of if we if we want to ask, so how can they change the money supply, which I think we've kind of discussed before, but this is a good time to review it. So they can increase the money supply, right? And one of the ways that they can increase the money supply is by buying, right? If they if they purchase, if they buy bonds on the open market. So the Federal Reserve goes out and they purchase bonds on the uh, in, on the market. And actually, let's just kind of, we can like draw it out here real quick. So we've got the Federal Reserve and let's say we've got some bond holders here, right? Bond holders here. And so what's actually happening? Well, the Federal Reserve will, will purchase the bond from the bond holder. So, so they get the bond, right, itself. They get the, the right to that, uh, to, to that income stream or to that bond itself. And then what does the Federal Reserve uh, give the bond holder for that, right? Well, they, they pay for it. And in, the, in America's case, the Federal Reserve, they, they pay for it with dollars. And that would be, right, in essence, this would be a way of increasing the money supply, the, the available money in the economy. The exact opposite is true if they wanted to decrease the money supply as well. So they could decrease the money supply, right? And they could do that by, by, by selling bonds. And if they sell those bonds, the exact opposite would be uh, taking place. Those, those individuals who would purchase the bond would then be paying money to the Federal Reserve, which would be taking some dollars out of the money supply. There's a few other ways that the Federal Reserve can uh, can change the money supply. They can uh, change the discount rate, right? So there's the discount rate. We've talked about the discount rate being the rate that the Federal Reserve lends to banks, right? That they lend directly to banks. And they could change that rate as well, which would increase or decrease the amount of uh, lending in the economy, which would increase or decrease the amount of the money supply in the economy as well. We'll really just kind of focus on these first two that we've discussed uh, a number of times. I think these are the most straightforward as we think through what the Fed can actually do to increase or decrease the money supply. And then what do we also have? Well, we've also got money demand here. So what is money demand? It's the demand for holding money itself. And so uh, let me just kind of mark this out. Money demand. And money demand here, we're speaking about the most liquid asset, right? We're actually talking about currency here. So this is the demand for currency. And it's really, right, we're thinking about this as the most liquid asset. And what is money demand? Well, it's really the demand for holding money itself rather than other assets, right? So it's the demand for holding this currency itself 
instead of other assets. So you right, I mean the other assets you could buy you could buy stocks, right? You could uh, you could uh, in, invest, you could make loans, right? You could do a number of other things with your money. What we're interested in is what is the demand for actually holding currency uh, or near currency itself, right? What's the what's the demand for holding dollars in your checking account that you're going to then go out and spend? So if we put these two things together, we've got kind of a general uh, theory that we can think about here. And I'm just gonna draw this out here. It's a typical supply and demand model that we think about in the in economics over and over on the y-axis over here. On the, on the vertical axis here, we've got the interest rate. So I've got the R here, and let me, I'll kind of clean that up a little bit. We've got interest rate, we got the interest rate right here. On the x-axis, we've got the quantity of money. And in particular, we're talking about kind of currency, the amount of money that would be held in, uh, in its most liquid asset that you can use to go out and purchase things. And what do we have? Well, we've got a couple of things here. I'll try to keep the colors the same. We've got the money supply, and that money supply is something that is set. Right, that money supply is set by the Federal Reserve. So we've got some sort of money supply that they that they choose to supply, some amount that they choose to supply to the economy for any number of reasons that we've discussed previously. And then we also have the money demand. And money demand has a kind of typical downward sloping relationship that we think of. And why why it has that, I want to kind of think through this. And I'm going to be even more specific here. This is money demand, and I'll just mark this in parentheses at a given price level at and I'll just kind of mark it as this you'll sometimes see it with a with a line over it, at a given price level and really what that's saying is let's hold the price level that we have previously discussed let's hold that constant if those prices are not changing for good then what is the real demand that we have for money and what we can see is that what's what it's balancing is your demand for currency would be dependent on how what's the interest rate that you could get for not holding in currency right so what do we actually have over here on this side of the spectrum why do we find this as our equilibrium point for the interest rate right why would this be our equilibrium interest rate well up here, and I'll kind of mark it right here, what do we have over here? This would be at a high, and I'll just kind of mark this here, uh, at a high, at a high interest rate, what do we know? At a high interest rate, if you're going to loan out money, you have a high return. So the return, right, at a high interest rate, the return on your money is high. And so you would hold, right, you would hold less you would hold less currency, and instead you would hold more assets. You would hold more assets where you're going to get some sort of return on your investment, where you're gonna have some sort of interest rate. You're gonna loan out more of your money, right? You're gonna put more of your money in savings, where you're not gonna have it directly as currency uh, or uh, kind of immediately be able to be used. And so that kind of makes sense. As the interest rate is higher, your demand for actual currency would be much lower because you're going to loan out more money or you're gonna put it into assets that are getting a higher return on investment. As that return on investment really decreases, when we're down here and area is down here, what do we have? Well, at low, right, kind of it's the exact opposite. At low interest rates, your return is low. Your return on investment is low, right? And so you're going to hold, you're going to hold more you're going to hold more currency itself. There's not as much of an there's not as much of an uh, of an incentive to hold assets that are bearing some sort of return if that return is very low. So you're not going to loan out as much money, or you won't hold as many stocks, right? Or those types of things. You're going to hold more currency because the opportunity cost of it is much lower. So this generally is the theory for liquidity preference, which is basically saying that we are we balance money demand and money supply by the interest rate and that interest rate is kind of what gives both the money demand this uh, this downward sloping effect uh, and also kind of understanding what's going on with the money supply itself as a result we can then think of well what happens if there's a change in the money supply how does that impact the economy or more importantly how does that uh, impact aggregate demand and that's what we'll focus on next